Welcome to Table for One, Episode 6. This week we're talking about the Oniverse, all three games. And I have a special guest with us this week to talk about them. Hey, so this is Anthony. I'm back with Episode 6 of Table for One, and I have Jason with me. Uh, Jason is a longtime listener. Uh, he actually won our Cool Stuff contest, not this last year, but the year before, so that long time. Um, and... <laughs> It, we've we've talked a little bit in the past about solo games, so this was kind of a perfect fit when I started uh, asking for people to hop on. Yeah, yeah, this is um, like I think you were the first one that pointed me to Oni Room uh, back in the day. I was just getting into games just to tell people about me. I've been gaming for about uh, five years, four years, something like that. Um, but I didn't get to solo games until Anthony opened up that whole world for me. Got Oni Room and just been playing solo games since. Success! We're done. Last episode. So, there it is. <laughs> Drop the mic. Spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome, though. I mean, I, I think I kind of stumbled into it too. Uh, pretty much after my daughter was born. I think a lot of people get into it the same around the same time as. Yeah. Uh, so many kids, not enough time to go out. Yeah, same. I have a 14 month old, and that it closely coincides with the advent of my solo gaming. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny too because. Before, you know, I had a, my son is five now, and I would go out occasionally in game, but it was the throwing in the second child just kept me home a lot. So yeah. now uh, apparently I do it a lot because I have a podcast about it. So. All right. Yeah, I, I don't even know if you remember this, Anthony. Um, when I first heard about BGA, I got in touch with you guys because you're like, oh, it's New York. I'm from New York, by the way, in case you couldn't tell, you know. <laughs> um so like i'm like oh who's in local new york like anthony's like yeah i'm local let's get together and i tried to invite you out to the game store and you're like oh can't go my kid is sick oh can't go. <laughs> ear infection <laughs> and it's like ah well, well we'll let it go it's like oh by the way i'm in pittsburgh now okay well see you on skype <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that was a rough year but that's not what we're here to talk about we're not here to talk about my sick kids uh, and they're actually healthy right now, so knock on wood. Cool. But we are here to talk about the Oniverse uh, and that all three games in the Oniverse currently that are in print. Uh, I say that because, uh, as many of you are probably well aware, these games go into and out of print fairly frequently. Uh, we have Onirim, which just now came back into print, and I didn't even realize it was out of print until I was kind of looking around the forums and just digging up information about how people were playing the game. And realize a lot of people were willing to pay large sums of money to get the game. Um, which I find kind of ridiculous. This is kind of the core of the Oniverse. This is the game. And it's, why is it out of print? That second edition is so beautiful and people want it. So, well, Why is Robinson Crusoe out of print? Well, you know, why is anything that Z-Men puts out out of print? Yeah, that's true. That's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and So fortunately, Sylveon and Castellion, you pretty much can find those two. Uh, those are the two that have come out in the last two years. Um, Urbion, going back, I believe that was the second game after Oniverse. Or Oni it was the first game. It was Urbion was before the Oniverse. Like, it was just there. I think it was called Equilibrion at the very first incarnation of it. And it's super simple. Uh, you could you could still find copies on the geek market. I'm waiting for the good reprint to dig, my, dig in. Yeah, because I know that... The copies of Onirim you could find for a while were just that little tuck box, and then they finally re-released the second edition with the eight expansions and the meeple mm -hmm. and all the stuff that went with it, and that's the version I have, and I'm sure a lot of other people. Uh, so we're just going to talk about the three that you can get. The nice ones, the the uh, four by four boxes with the nice meeples and all the expansions, right. um, especially because we have the fourth one in that series coming out sometime in the next three months, Nautilion. Woo! That some of us are excited Woo! for. I don't know who. <laughs> um, so this will be a nice primer for everybody who is either just now able to buy Onirim or is looking forward to that next one. Mm -hmm. All right. So what we're going to do, we'll give, a, I guess, a real quick summary of each of these games. And then we'll just generally talk about uh, the games, how they play, what we like about them, uh, and then the Oniverse in general, kind of the... Th I won't say theme, and we were talking about this before the show, it's not really theme so much as the aesthetic of the universe itself kind of uh, dictates what they play like and how they feel. Mm -hmm. So the core of this series, starting with Onirim, this is uh, a card game. It's a straight card game. And the theme is 
theme, quote unquote story, is you're lost in a labyrinth, you're trying to find these doors before dream time runs out. So basically all you need to do in the game is you need to find eight door cards, uh, two of each color, and to do that you need to play cards in a row of the same color with different symbols. So each of these different colored cards has one of three different symbols on it. Uh, the moon, the star, or the sun, and the key. Uh, and so you need to play them in order, but not you can't have like two moons in a row or two stars in a row. Um, you will discard keys as well when you draw a door card to discover it. But throughout all this, there's going to be nightmare cards that pop up and cause you to have to discard things or get rid of keys or remove things from your tableau. And the challenge of it, of course, is to get all of these doors out before uh, you run out of cards in the deck and you have too many nightmares. Um, pretty straightforward. You can play through the game in, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And it is decently challenging. I won't say the, the base game is super challenging. But the reason why this is so in demand is that if you buy that second edition box, it comes with eight different expansions. So... You have the Towers, the Happy Dreams, Dark Premonitions, the Book of Lost Steps, Lost and Found, the Glyphs, the Dreamcatchers, the Crossroads and Dead Ends, the Door to the Oniverse. Bottom line is there's a lot of different ways to play the game. And as you add these things in, it gets way more complicated. So uh, I, I know for me, this is one of probably one of my favorite solo games, maybe the favorite solo game I have just because of that variety. Um, Jason, what about you? I mean, where does this one sit for you? Oh, I mean, this is by far my favorite uh universe game and i think it's like my fifth sixth favorite game of all time it's a really high up there like way higher up there than a little uh, card game should be probably but i love it um like we were talking about before about like the theme and the mechanics both kind of being attractive like theme we keep on saying theme but like the style of it it kind of has that dark lonely dream vibe you know, the um, the artist, uh, her name, actually, we have it right here, uh, Elise Plessis. You're going to have to help me out with that pronunciation. Um, I think that's is fabulous. You know, uh, she's, you know, real painter. I think Shadi Toby kind of found her at an art museum one day uh, in Europe. It's like, oh, draw my game. And she's like, okay, sure. <laughs> and it just, yeah, it just works. Like, and I, I sometimes I'll see, like, kind of hate in the forums, like, oh, this looks like a child drew it. Uh, no. It's really, it just puts me in a good mood, you know. Um, even if, you know, a lot of people kind of bash it, it's not a great theme, but the style totally makes up for it. The style is the theme. I really believe that. Uh, mechanically, it's simple, but I love the decision points in it. So, like, you're mentioning about the keys. So, you know, you're sitting there, and you have, you're growing a set, and you're looking at your key going, hmm, I could use my key to finish this set, or I can use it to trigger the prophecy and try to kill a nightmare. And that sounds like a simple enough decision, but when you're kind of going through it, you're making that decision a bunch of times, and it's like, oh, you know, sometimes it's worth it to just complete a set and get a door, um, which is which I like that. That's pretty cool. Do I want to – I'm building a set, but I have hands full of another, another color. Do I cut the set off and start a new color? Just, you know, or do I push my luck and just keep on drawing until I, get, I finish the set? awesome like just really great and and it's constant throughout the game it's 15 minutes but you're always making these little decisions which is why i i really feel like it kind of shines above the other two games are good but i think this one is just a cut above yeah i think i'd agree with you i mean i and the reason i know that is because every time i pull this one out i i never play it just once i'll always play it right. three four five six times uh and my wife will be like, what are you shuffling so much? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was in my negative section. The shuffling is, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, that is tough. Pretty much any time anything hits that discard that's not supposed to be there, you got to shuffle it all back in. It, you end up shuffling the deck, what, 10, 15 times per game? So, my cards are sleeved. They'd be trash by now if they weren't sleeved. Oh, I know. I, I, I wanted to sleeve them, and then I didn't. And now they're kind of in that in, in the middle stage where they're mildly trashed. And I guess I'll I guess I'll wait for that reprint because mm -hmm. uh, they don't really fit in the box though if you sleeve them all the way. So yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's the unfortunate thing. My little meeple is lonely sitting in there. Uh, I still have the box; it's beautiful, but I don't know. It it I play it a lot, so 
like I'll play another game, like I'll, I'll put something on there, and then that'll be my palate cleanser. It's like, okay, let me go back to this this game. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It, it's it definitely fits that bill. Uh, it's not super gimmicky. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. It feels like a solitaire card game, but yeah, those decisions are so, you know, they come up every time, but every time they come up, they're slightly different. And, right. you, you know, your point about the art, I really feel like, uh, and maybe it's because there's multiple of these games. So as you play them, you know, you really do feel like you're part of the Oniverse. You know, that's, these are all linked together by really nothing more than the artwork. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I know technically they're in the same world, but you can play all these games, not realize that without reading the flavor text. And they're very, they're relatively abstract uh, in terms right. of gameplay. But the artwork really ties them all together. And you feel like you're playing the same series of games every time. And that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Like I, I read some comment on the forum. It's like, oh, this game has no theme. It's super abstract. It's I mean, that's kind of missing the point. Like, you know, the point are that they, they are simple games, but they do have that through line, that through line of like this dreamy, um, sometimes dark, sometimes bright, sometimes kind of foreboding, sometimes lighthearted. But always you could tell it's the same person. They tell us the same spirit in the whole series. Yeah, and they all have kind of the same feel to them. Uh, difficult, not too difficult. You can make it more difficult. Lots of different ways to play it. Uh, yeah, speaking of like the variants, like I like to shuffle them all together, which I know is insane because you have a 45-minute filler on your hands at that point. <laughs> but that's it's cool. Also, um, like for people who are kind of thinking of buying on- Onirim, I do recommend at least seeing if you can find a promos. Even if you don't want to buy them, they're easy enough rules to download. You can kind of fake it. Um, the Mirrors promo adds, a, I think this is my favorite individual kind of expansion for it. So, you know, if people want to kind of look out for that. I don't generally like, okay, you have to have every promo, but that one is just really good. Yeah, it makes sense when it actually adds something to the game. Yeah, like that, the Mirrors promo, what that does is like a lot of times you just have that discard for no reason. The Mirrors gives you stuff to do even with useless cards. You know, it gives you, like, these little special powers, which is, hey, sure, you know, more decisions and more stuff to do. Yeah, I mean, it solves one of the only really downsides of the game is sometimes you, yeah, you get a turn where you're like, eh, nothing happens. Well, now I'm one, you know, one little bit closer to drawing something I don't need. Uh, that's That really helps. Yeah. So, yeah, own your room, buy it, if it's still in print by the time this podcast comes out. <laughs> it should be. They just printed it. Here's hoping Asmodee owning Z-Man F2Z will get this stuff in print more often. Right. All right. So the next one on the list, Sylveon, this one came out, uh, I believe, two years ago, maybe three. And it is the second in the current series. So the ones that you, again, the ones you can buy right now. Uh, The theme is Tower Defense. So it's, again, I say theme. The mechanics are Tower Defense. (laughs) Uh, And basically what you have is you have this mad fire elemental lord trying to burn down the dream forest so you're going to set up this grid of different forest cards and then you'll have the fire elementals on the right in uh, four different stacks and they're going to advance one by one across the board um, and you need to put out trees fountains animals play different special abilities that will slow them down or discard them or weaken them uh, before they burn down the forest and the goal of this is when the waves are all finished, when the all the elemental decks have run out, you want to be able to flip all of those forests over and have a healthy forest in the end and not a dead one. Um, and this is all assuming you get that far, where the waves don't take you out before you get uh, to the end of the game. There are There is a basic mode where you just kind of use the cards that they give you, or there's a slightly more advanced mode where you'll draft a deck of cards uh, that you basically get to decide what kinds of cards you have available to you to combat um, this encroaching fire elemental uh, wave as you defend your forest. Um, A couple of expansions in the box as well. So a lot of different complexities to it. Um, What do you think about this one? (laughs) You mean Plants vs. Zombies, the card game? (laughs) (laughs) It's the first thing I thought. It's like, oh, wow, I'm I'm laying down plants, and they're fighting off the big menace. uh, well, no, I, I think, like, I, I do enjoy Sylveon. Um, it's probably my, the, it's number three in the ranking for me. Uh, I mean, the, the good parts are that it has that, it does tower defense really well. It, it really evokes that sense of, okay, defending yourself against hordes and attacking, counterattacking. Uh, I think the special powers are fun. 
Like Onirim had no special powers. It was that, and it was abstract in that way. This game, you can, you know, you can just play your regular stuff, or you can play an elephant and kill something, or play uh, doves and shorten the game. You know, like it, it, it does that sense of special power, and it gives you room to kind of find combos in those special powers. So, like, I'm gonna play a whale to move him over here and set him up for this geyser, stuff like that. You know, uh, that's. That that part is really cool. Um, the negatives for me, it might be a little too long. Like Onirim, you could play in 15 minutes as a good palate cleanser. This thing, you got to set it up, especially through the draft. It takes a while to kind of set that draft up and everything. Maybe you're looking at half hour, 45 minutes, which is might be a little bit long. The X-Pack just adds cards. doesn't take any away, so it's even longer. Uh, so that, I mean, I don't know if you got that uh, sense of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat with you. I mean, I think what you have here is... Well, I remember the first time I played it, I was like, this is great. You know, this is really... Uh, there's a lot to it. There's a lot more depth here. There's a lot of cool things you can do. Uh, but at the same time, I almost never play this. Like, if I'm, like, sitting there thinking, I'm going to play one of these three, I'll probably grab Onirim. I might grab Castellion, which we'll talk about next, but Sylveon's usually at the bottom of the list because not only do I need to make sure I have a table. Uh, oh, the footprint. Oh, my goodness. It's a big game. <laughs> it takes up because you're building that grid and then you got to do the draft and everything else. You have the cards all around it. And then, yeah, the time is prohibitive. Uh, if you play the basic game, you can get through it a lot quicker, but that's not nearly as interesting. Yeah. And the draft really drags things out. So if you have the time, but when I have the time, I'd almost rather grab, you know, something bigger and meatier, you know, one of my right. Civ games or a Rosenberg game, you know, really go to town than Sylveon. So it just doesn't hit the table that often, even though when it does, I do like it. Yeah. Like, uh, and I think the other thing about the draft is like, you can really win or lose the game at the draft. Like if you draft a halfway competent deck, you're probably going to win. And I didn't love that. You know, once I kind of figured out how to draft the deck, then I was like, oh, okay, I just boom, 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 boom. I know what's good. Oh, yeah, I need these, the four, uh, well, the four-point fountains or whatever it is, and a couple of hedgehogs. It's like, all right, I'm good to go, and I win. And, you know, I, I, I'll lose Onirim, and I will lose Castellion every once in a while. And it's like, okay, Sylveon, I just don't feel like the difficulty is there, and I can kind of tie one hand behind my back you know, draw last cards or whatever it is, but that's not quite that fun either. So, you know, I I don't, like, I know it's been a lot of negatives, and yeah, I, like you said, I like the game as well, but it it is number three, a, a, a solid number three for me. I would agree with that, yeah. And I remember when I got this game too, and the first couple of times I played it, I beat it, and anytime I beat a solo game immediately after learning it, I'm like, well, that's not great. Uh, and then doing the draft, first couple times lost and then beat it pretty consecutively so i remember looking it up going on bgg and thinking is this game too easy and that was an ongoing conversation when it was just yeah. first out so we're not alone on that and i don't think anybody is going to argue that the game can come across as too easy because it's solvable to some degree uh mm -hmm. it's, you've got finite you know mechanisms in place and when you compare it to something like oni room where of course it's the randomness of the draw combined with whatever expansions you throw in there it's it's definitely different, and I would agree it's probably third on my list, too. So with that, we'll move on to the third one on the list, and that's Castellion. So this one came out, I believe, last year, and it is the third in the current series. So in this one, what you're doing is you're building a castle. You're at the center of Oniverse, you're under attack, and you're rushing to build a castle to defend against three attacks. So as you build your castle... Uh, certain things will trigger that cause these attacks to happen. You'll be pulling out certain tiles from the pool of tiles that you can build from. What you'll need to do to, to defeat these waves is to build certain formations in your castle. Um, you know, towers, keeps, ranks, making sure everything matches the specific needs of those cards, while at the same time setting yourself up for the future cards because you need to make sure you have the things in place um, to defeat all three of these cards, not just the first one, not just the second one, you have to get through all three of them. And at the end of this, once you've defeated all three, you need to have at least that bottom row. You need to have your foundation in place of six tiles at the bottom to win the game. The 
most interesting part of the game is the different ways that the different tiles interact with each other. You can't place different the same shape next to another tile when you initially place it, but there's different rules that allow you to kind of tweak that and move things around. Tiles have special abilities when you discard them. Uh, there's going to be different ways that you can interact with the castle that you're building depending on the tiles you play and different tiles you can pull as well to kind of mitigate the risk of what you're pulling out um, at any given point. So it's it's a very interesting game. It's very different than the other two, much like Sylveon's very different than Onirim. And uh, it's one that, uh, as you said, Jason, that I think is second for me. It's, it's one that I bring out a lot more often. Uh, it mm -hmm. does have a little bit bigger of a footprint, I think, than Onirim, but not so much that I feel it's onerous to set up. Right. Yeah, I, I, it's like if that if Sylvia was Plants vs Zombies the card game, this is definitely like t more Tetris. Uh, on the end of things, very spatial, like you know, um, people who are which is not necessarily me. Um, I'm more of a really theme story guy, but I like how the blocks just kind of like, oh, there's a triangle and there's a circle, and oh my god, I have a triangle, a uh, square and a circle, and I can't put a piece in there. What can I do to kind of manipulate it so I can fit pieces in there? Uh, so that, that part is super cool. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then when you get to that point where you realize you can't actually place anything and you're like, well, what can I actually mess with to actually get one of these tiles down? And then you maybe stare at it for two or three minutes and realize that if you move just the one, swap it with another one, um, mm -hmm. with a special power, then it actually solves the whole problem. Those are immensely satisfying moments. And it's not something you really get in, even in Oni Rim, it's kind of unique to this game. Right, and the thing that uh, funny you mentioned that the thing that this game does, they very similar to Oni Room, like the traders, they come out and kind of mess you up just like the nightmares do in Oni Room. But in this game, you can kind of use them to your advantage. So the trader will come out, knock out four pieces or three pieces, whatever you got built. But you can make it so that they knock out useless pieces. It's like, oh, I was trying to find a way to get rid of that. Oh, thank you, trader. And that's really satisfying and smart too when you kind of build your castle in a way where you can absorb those hits and it feels really protean like it feels really like i'm really morphing this castle to respond to these threats so that's pretty cool yeah and that's that's the coolest part because that's the whole theme of the game is you have to be able to adjust and morph and tweak your castle to match the different threats and there's different levels too there you don't just have three cards there's different levels at which you can you know to tackle this game so i really like that idea of kind of the the different ways that tiles are going to come out and interact with each other and because it's a blind draw out of a huge pile of tiles it's very different every time right and i'll be kind of speaking of that going towards my one kind of probably the biggest thing that i have against this game the it's a big pile of things but the, so that which makes the luck kind of it hurts more in this game so like you can get two black traders in the advanced game pretty early and your host I was like, oh, that <laughs> time to pat, you know, put them all in the bag and start again. Or you can get it to a rhythm where it's like, oh, I'm building my castle. I have four or five pieces, trader, four or five pieces, trader, four or five pieces, trader. Doesn't happen all the time. But when it does happen, it's like, oh, why did I even start? So that can be a little bit. Uh, well, not a little bit. It's, it, it's frustrating when that happens. Yeah, I think we've all been there. <laughs> like, all right. Why am I even playing this game right now? Let's just put it away. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, I, I had uh, seven straight traders. How many uh, tiles in a discard pile now? Oh, okay. Um, let's try this again. Yeah, I mean, it, just for me, like, it's it's a good game. And may, and um, it does things that Oni Rim doesn't. And I could see people putting this above Oni Rim just for that spatial aspect and everything. But just those little niggles, the fact that it's kind of spatial, which is more of a personal thing for me. And then some of the luck experiences that I've had, maybe I'm just like traumatized by terrible luck, which is <laughs> no, which is not unique among gamers. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, these dice are against me, and whatever. So like, these tiles are against me. I'm never gonna play this game again. Uh, you know, so those are like little niggles. But no, this is a, this is a great game. Like, if somebody just only bought only this, then they're doing fine. Yeah, this is a good one. This is one when I first got it. I think I played a lot more than Oni Rim. Uh, kind of that fresh new game feel, but it stuck around where Sylveon lasted maybe two or three weeks. This one stuck around for a couple months uh, as kind of the primary solo that I was playing. Oni Rim has kind of snuck back up. It's just a steady, you know, it's a steady member yeah. of the rotation. 
Uh, but Castellan still comes out pretty frequently. I feel like I alternate between the two. The difference mm-hmm. being that if I bring out Onirim, I'll play it a lot in one yeah. sitting. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm at the point, I'm probably more solid lead. Like, I'll play Onirim just all the time. Like, And the other thing, I know this is a solo podcast. The two-player version of Onirim is probably the best in the series. The two-player version of Castellan is by far the worst. It's it's almost unplayable as a two-player, but enough about that on a solo podcast. <laughs> no, but it's important <laughs> to mention because, I mean, some people buy these things thinking, you know, I'm going to play it by myself, but justifying the purchase here, maybe I'll also play it with my partner. Uh, right. I have not played Castellan two-player. I have played Onirim two-player. It plays pretty well. Yeah, the, the thing about Castellan is that the traders come out often enough to where one person isn't even building a castle. Like, oh, I'm going to steer all the traders. Like, I'll use the seer to steer the traders towards you. And it's like, oh, my castle's destroyed again. My castle's destroyed again. And basically all you kind of do is get the base while the other person does the goal. And you kind of have to flip that around. It, it's just, like, you don't want one person to, to not play, you know? Yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> that defeats the purpose. Doesn't, that doesn't work too well. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as some people, they can make it work. It's, it wasn't for us. All right, so there we have it. Uh, we have all three of the Oniverse games, and I think we're both pretty solidly in agreement here. Uh, Onirim 1, Castellian 2, Sylveon 3. Yeah. And we'll see where the new one falls. I mean, we don't really know much about it yet. We know it's a nautical theme. We know there's cute little pieces on a kind of a little ships running around a space on a board. Dice. Um, dice. That's what we have, dice. Dice in a Torbay game. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not like all dice because those all dice solo games murder me. But <laughs> well, you like hostage negotiator. That's that's the one where we're gonna have to get into a, more of a disagreement because I. Ugh. <laughs> you know what it is though. The first two times I played that game, I beat it. And uh-huh. when I beat it, I, first time I played with the designer, the second time I just played by myself. But he was like, "That doesn't happen." And I was like, "All right, well, it seemed pretty easy to me. I have not beat it since." <laughs> I had it for over a year. I've, I've played it maybe a couple dozen times. I've not beat the game mm-hmm. since. And I've had those mm-hmm. games where I'm like, ah, I see why people hate this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yep. man. I, I have it, and who wants it for trade? It's, <laughs> it's all yours, man. Oh, man. I still like it, though. I still think it's fun. It has a lot of variability. But I have to be in a certain kind of mood to want to play a dice game. Hostage Negotiator, Death Angel. But we'll see how Natalian does. Maybe it's light dice. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not, I mean, I'm just joking. I'm, I'm, it's as soon as I hit pre-order, I'm like, boom, there it is. And you know, I, basically, he can do no wrong. Like he'd ha- like Shaddy would have to just release a bunch of garbage in order for me to not buy it, which I, it has not happened so far. Bunch of rocks in a box. Please stack these. You win. <laughs> but don't stack the fifth rock. That black rock will kill you every time. <laughs> that's, that's like the solo games we played when we were kids. <laughs> yeah all right yeah so there you go guys i mean if you are on the fence about oniverse if you are just getting into solo games if you maybe have sylveon or castellion and we're wondering whether you should buy oni rim 2 um answer to that is yes but answer in general is these are linchpins i have you know i have my little shelf of go-to games when i have just a few extra minutes it has those three games maybe three or four others hostage negotiator is in there Full transparency. Um, <laughs> Not in mine. <laughs> but those three are kind of the linchpins where those come out more often than anything else. And I think a lot of solo gamers, that's that's going to be the fallback because they're just they're good, solid games. They're fun. And you can play them a million times because they have so much variability to them, but also all those extra expansions that come in the box. Um, and we didn't even mention that either. I mean, you mentioned a little bit, but the production on these boxes is fantastic. It's yeah, just fun to yeah. open them. And the, the the cards are good quality. Like, they really took care of you on that end. The meeples, they all three games have meeples, which are not just cute. They integrate. So, like, they're all mini expansions. And the way he designed them was, like, each one either makes the game easier or harder. So, you know, if you're getting your butt kicked, you can kind of use the meeple to help you out. If you are you need a challenge, that meeple will, like, oh, here's less of resources. It's sucking you in. So, just you know, and it's a cute meeple, which is always important. Yeah, yeah. They, you put them all together, it makes it for a nice little photo. People are like, what is that? 
All right, guys. So that's everything for our special Oniverse only episode. Uh, stay tuned in the next two to three months when Atelian comes in. I wish I knew when, but it's a Z-Man game, so they're not going to tell us until it's in the store and we get the phone call. So mm -hmm. hopefully sometime before the end of the year. If not, hopefully beginning of the year. But these are the linchpins of a lot of solo collections. So hopefully you have some or can track them down and enjoy those games. All right. And so I just once again, thank you, Jason, for coming on. Wow, this was awesome, man. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot of fun to have someone else on and not just be talking to myself for half an hour. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, hopefully, you know, people don't um, find me annoying and I can come back and, you know, chat with you some more. Yeah, man. No, it's been great. And you've honestly, you've had more information about these games than I had even written down. I didn't know the artists of the games. I just know I like the art. So good on you. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that is everything for this week and make sure you stop on by uh, boardgamersanonymous.com you're going to find the most recent episodes of table for one as well as board gamers anonymous uh, a new episode of that should be up here in the next week or so uh, before the end of the month and uh, board game geek we have our guild at 1735 stop in there connect with us facebook look for board gamers anonymous and then twitter at bga podcast uh, we are posting pretty much every day to both of those uh we have all the regular content we put up the reviews on the website as well as some recent playthroughs and games we've been running through so that is everything for this week next week we'll be back until then i'll save you a seat at this table for one later